Uh, one other quick, quick announcement. Um, right now, over in Lusaka, Zambia, there's a Bible conference going on as well of grace believers, so keep them in your prayers. Des told me to tell everybody hi and that he's having a good time ministering over there. I talked to him about two days ago, so this they're having a conference uh, this weekend as well, so good things going on over there. But let's go ahead and let's start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into our message this morning. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you that we can come together. We thank you for the opportunity to hear your word and to teach your word, and we, we just thank you that we have your word. I pray that uh, as we study today, that we'll grow and be edified. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so the title of my message is Prayer and the Word of God. And it's some thoughts that I have on prayer and some passages about prayer that have changed how I think about prayer a little bit. And hopefully it'll show you some insight into some prayer and at least give you something to think about and something to chew on a little bit. It's often said that when people learn grace, that they stop praying, that their prayer life goes away. And if you ask yourself, well, why is that? Well, once I learn I'm complete in him and forgiven all trespasses, that might kill about 80% of my prayer life because <laughs> most of my prayer life is spent begging for forgiveness if I don't understand salvation by grace through faith, right? So if you cut out most of that, you've got a little bit that you're left with. And then you learn that you're not under a covenant program where if you do this, then God's going to do this. And that cuts out, I don't know, I'm making numbers up, but maybe another 10%. So now you're just left to about a 10% prayer life because things have changed so drastically as you've grown in the word of God. Uh, nonetheless, though, I, I, I find it fascinating that 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, what does it say? Pray without ceasing. That's a command, right? I mean, that's not, that's not like, hey, if you get some time, how about a little prayer? It's, it, it says pray without ceasing. So what that teaches us, that prayer is an essential part of spiritual growth, even if it's misunderstood by most of Christianity, it is an essential part of spiritual growth. When we look at Romans chapter 12, verse 12, you don't have to turn there. We'll, we'll turn to a verse in a second. But in Romans chapter 12, verse 12, we're told to continue instant in prayer. And when you, when you read that word continue, that's kind of like 1 Thessalonians 5 with the pray without ceasing, meaning it's not going to stop, correct? But then it tells us to do continue instant in prayer. And to me, that gives me the idea when I read that verse that prayer no matter what happens in my life, should be the first option that I reach for as I learn to deal with things that are going on in the world. So I'm going to continue to pray, but not only am I going to continue to pray, but I'm going to be instant in prayer as things happen. Another thing I find fascinating about prayer, if you will, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6, and when, when I say Ephesians chapter 6, I hope that your mind goes to spiritual warfare, and it goes to armor, and when we look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it says, and take up, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, but it doesn't end there, it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So there, the passage doesn't end with the armor, right? It doesn't end with the sword of the spirit. He actually goes on to say, Praying, and how does he tell us to pray there? He tells us praying always with all prayer and supplication, and then he tells us in the Spirit, watching thereunto with
with all perseverance. Now that watching there is not watching like I'm going to pray that I get a chocolate chip cookie and I'm going to watch to see if it shows up because then I can praise God, right? We laugh, but if we're honest, we think about prayer that way sometimes, don't we? So I'm going to pray and I'm going to watch. That's not, that's not the watch there. The watch there is, is, is vigilance. It's, it's, it's staying up. It's, it's being attentive to what's going on around and committing that to prayer based off of what the Spirit tells us to do and how does the Spirit communicate it to us today? Through the Word. So take that as an introduction as if we're going to study God's Word and we're going to learn about prayer, prayer is something that is commanded of us It is a part of spiritual warfare. We're supposed to continue in it. We're supposed to be instant in it. It is an extremely important part of our spiritual life. Now, one thing, I've got a couple points I want to make today. We'll review them at the end, but we're going to look at an idea of large to small. We're going to look at Romans 8 as the pattern of prayer. And then we're going to look at different prayers throughout the scriptures based off of what we learn in Romans chapter 8. And then we're going to learn about what do we do with all this information. So here's my first point. And it's large to small. And we're going to spend some time here because it's important as we think about prayer. If you turn to Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, I love Romans chapter 8. I, d- I don't know about you, but when, 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 I, when I read Romans chapter 8, you, you know, you just left an old, old wretched man, and uh, then you find out by the end of Romans 8 that you can't be separated, right? What, what a, what a, there, there's a big transition between those two things, so you've got to look in the middle to say, hey, what happened here? And when we look, we see that Romans chapter 8 starts off with this. It says, what shall we... I'm sorry, there is now, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, I want to stop right there with this idea of large to small. When people think about their prayer life, by the way, as I speak today, um, I'm going to use some generalities about how I used to think about my prayer life, and I think they're somewhat common of how people think about their prayer life. Um, But let me just say this off the bat. Does prayer include request? It does. Philippians chapter 4 says that. Um, And as we mature in Christ, do our requests change? They do. Um, So we'll get into some points like that. But I I just want everybody to understand off the get-go, I I believe that prayer includes request. Um, But Romans chapter 8 talks about We walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So if we think about a big picture and we think about prayer life, most people think about their prayer life from the minute, tiniest details in their life. Where where does God want me to get gas today? Where does does God want me to eat today? Uh, Why did God give me a headache today? Whatever it is, they think about it from these small details and... Prayer includes requests, so don't get me wrong, but they think about it from this idea, and they say, what is God's will for me today when it comes to lunch? And that's just a backwards way to think about prayer. The way we should think about prayer is understanding that there's two major influences in the world today, right? And and Romans sums that up by flesh and the spirit. And if we think about that, we understand that there are two realms that we deal with. Colossians teaches us visible and invisible. So let's talk about the flesh for a minute. The flesh is influenced by the world. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And, and just look what Ephesians chapter 2 teaches us. Ephesians 2, 
We'll just start in verse 2. Wherein, in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, and of course that's our life, not just our speech, in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the, desi the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So there we get a great summary of how the world works and how the world influences us, right? It influences our flesh as verse... I just lost my place. As verse 3 says that we have our conversation in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And the world, the course of this world, is controlled by who? Satan, all right? And this refers to him as the prince of the power of the air. Second Corinthians refers to him as the god of this world, all right? So when we think about the flesh, our flesh is influenced because of the lusts in our flesh by the course of this world, which is controlled by the prince of the power of the air, the power of the air the God of this world. Pretty simple, right? Not only that, but most everybody else in the world is influenced that way because the course of the world is just designed to do that. Now, there's two types of people in the world. So we have two things going on in the world. We have the flesh and the spirit. We understand that the flesh is influenced by the world, that that's controlled by the God of this world. And then we have two peoples that there's realm of influence with that with. And what would those two people be? Saved and unsaved, right? So does Satan have a plan, maybe somewhere that's a, revealed to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, about his plan for the unsaved? And what is his plan for the unsaved? That they remain blind, exactly, to the gospel. So Satan has a plan to keep the saved unsaved by keeping them blind to the gospel, and then he has a plan for the saved, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 teaches us, to move them away from the simplicity of the gospel, to keep them ineffective at edifying and ineffective at evangelizing. Correct? So if we get these big ideas of this is how Satan works, this is how his influence works in my life through the course of this world, working in my flesh to pull me away so that I'm moved away from the simplicity that in Christ and become ineffective for him. So that's one giant area of influence in our life. As believers, we should be influenced in another way, correct? Isn't that we're not supposed to walk after the flesh, we're supposed to walk after the, the spirit. So let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, how does God, how, let me, uh, let me ask the question this way. How do we 100% know today how God influences the world? What's the concrete way that we know this is how God influences the world today? All right? <laughs> People, it, it, we 100% know that God influences the world today through his word working in the church, the body of Christ, and the church, the body of Christ, going out and working in the world to accomplish two things. Can we 100% agree on that, right? That God works through his word. His word works, what's the word? For effectually. His word works effectually in us and then as it works in us it works out of us and we go accomplish two major things in the world satan wants to accomplish blinding people to the gospel and moving people away from the simplicity that's in christ god first timothy chapter two let's turn there first timothy chapter two for the most simple explanation
of what God is doing in this world today. If you want the most basic, large overview, in my opinion, of God's will for today, it's in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, which says, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And that lines up opposite of what we went over with Satan. So God's plan in the world today is for his word to work in the life of the believers. That's referred to as edification in the scriptures and being built up, rooted, grounded, established, all those words that hopefully you know and you're familiar with, that's the edification process. That's the coming to the knowledge of the truth. Now, <clears throat> for the unsaved, it's his desire that they get saved, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I told you this section is labeled large to small, and hopefully I hope what you've seen is that we've moved more from what's for lunch today to some very important things that are going to echo throughout eternity. It's the idea that God's, God's will, I'm not saying that God doesn't care what you have for lunch today, but what I'm saying is there might be something more important for your life than that decision about lunch, right? And the way we determine those things in life is by aligning ourselves as believers with what God is doing in the big picture. And what we end up doing is we end up taking his desire, who will have all men to be saved, and we're talking on a very basic level, there's more things than that, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And we take those desires and through the study of the word as we get the knowledge of the truth and get built up, they become our desires, right? That's a big picture way to look at prayer because prayer and desire are very closely related. If prayer re includes request and sometimes the word prayer Pray is used as ask in the Bible, right? I pray you. It's a simple request that I ask you. So when we look at prayer that way, we, we realize that, hey, my prayer life needs to align with what God does. I can ask for anything I want, but it, want, it needs to, as I grow, align with what God is doing. So let me encourage you, first point, is think about things from large to small when you think about prayer. And stop with the small to large. Align yourself with what God is doing and what God is doing in the dispensation of grace more than our concern about lunch. Unless it's getting close to noon. No, no. We, we, we want to keep that there. Now, let's go back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And I want to talk about Romans chapter 8 as a foundational passage for how we should think about prayer. And let me give you one really simple reason of why you should think about Romans 8 as a foundational passage for prayer. And the first one is, is that we are told in Romans chapter 8, in verse 15... For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That's that the, the, the crying to Abba, Father, is something that we find three times in the scriptures. We find it in Galatians chapter 4, and we find it in Mark chapter 14, when Jesus Christ is praying to the Father. So... All of those places, in Mark chapter 14, Jesus Christ is so overwhelmed with the thought of going to the cross that he falls down and prays, right? And he, he, he prays, Abba, Father. Now, you think about that. Romans, Romans chapter 8 is written to us Gentiles, which Ephesians chapter 2 teaches us don't really have a great rep reputation in the world, right? It teaches us that we 
after salvation, get this privilege to call on Jesus Christ, Abba, or to call on God the Father, Abba, Father, right? That's, that's quite the privilege. So on a very simple level, when you look at Romans chapter 8, you see that it's talking about prayer and talking about the relationship that we have with the Father through Christ. It's a very important passage. The other thing is we get the big picture because it starts off with the flesh versus the spirit and it teaches us some things about that. Verse 6, Romans chapter 8, verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So we see that our carnal mind is enmity against God, and then it goes on to tell us what the result of sin is in the world as it talks about the groanings of creation. Now, I find a lot of comfort in Romans chapter 8, and there's, there's, there's something that we learn about God in Romans chapter 8 that gets overlooked in modern Christianity. Modern, modern Christianity is often, even if it's not purposely health and wealth, it is definitely taught that if you just trust Christ, everything gets better, right? Now, God's more honest than that. He, he teaches us in Romans chapter 8. Just let's, let's look at Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> and uh, let's go to verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared which the glory shall be which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So that talks about pain and it talks about suffering. Everybody's favorite subject, right? Hey, pain and suffering. Can I get a little of that today? Well, if you live in a sin-cursed world and you do, you're going to get a little pain and suffering today, right? That's, that's how life works. But God doesn't hide that from us. He tells us that that's what happens in a sin-cursed world. And Jesus Christ died to deliver us from this present evil world. So God's answer to the pain and suffering in Romans chapter 8 is that the hope that he gives us in Christ. So what we've seen is we've gone from the flesh and the spirit Two major factors that are working. Matter of fact, those things in your spiritual life, do we ever master walking in the spirit and oh, I don't have to ever worry about the flesh anymore? No. <laughs> That's something we're always going to deal with. But then we have to deal with, not only with that, but we have to deal with the pain and suffering on this earth that sin has caused. But God's answer to that is the hope that he's given us in Christ, Right? So if we think about where we go from Romans chapter 7, wretched man, flesh versus spirit, pain and suffering, hope, but not only hope, but look at what verse 26 says, likewise also the spirit, likewise the spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be other, uttered. Skip down to verse 34, it says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who, is also make it, who also maketh intercession for us. So do we have some things that are working for us in this terribly sin-cursed earth? We do. And what are those things that we have working for us? Well, we've got the Spirit, we've got Christ himself making intercession for us. So if we pray something a little wrong, I think, we, think, think we're covered, right? But we should still think about and wonder how, how, how actually should we pray. So 
back to the whole point of Romans 8, we've got flesh versus spirit, big picture stuff here. We've got pain and suffering on this earth. And then we have the intercession that's being made for us. And by the time we get to the end of the chapter, we have verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, I don't know about you, but that's a trip that I have to take every day. Meaning, in my mind, in, in, in the inner man, in the new man, I have to run through that trip every day because... The course of this world is so powerful that if I am not vigilant and watching what is going on, that fast before I know it, I'm walking in the flesh, I'm concentrating on the things that are going on in this world and this pain and this suffering, and all of a sudden, I'm no longer rejoicing in Christ for all the wonderful things that are done for me, which is another command. We're supposed to rejoice in the Lord always. You ever ask yourself, how do you rejoice in the Lord always? Well, the only way to do that is by understanding the process that takes place in Romans chapter 8. That is foundational for prayer. Now, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12. You know, if we're talking about prayer, we're probably going to be in Philippians 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. But I want you to look at something that happens in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I titled this message Prayer and the Word of God because it's pretty hard to understand prayer without the Word of God. And I would say it's, it's, there is a very specific aspect that we see about the Word of God and how it enters into prayer. Now, I told you to, work, I told you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, but I also want you to think about uh, Philippians chapter 4. We're supposed to let our requests be made known to God. And what's that supposed to go with? Thanksgiving, right? So we make our requests known to God. But 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul um, says in verse 7, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So where was the thorn given to him? In the flesh. Does that sound like the beginning of Romans chapter 8? So we're going to mess around with your flesh a little bit. So he's given this thorn in the flesh, and it's to buffet him. That's the middle of Romans chapter 8. That's the pain and the suffering that he's going through. So he, met, he lets his request be made known unto God thrice. And verse 9 says, and he said unto me, enter the word of God, right? And he said unto me, he said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, we all know that verse, right? We all know that verse. But when it comes to the rubber meets the road, the flesh hurts. I'm in the midst of pain and I'm in the midst of suffering. That verse loses its power as a slogan if we just think of it as a slogan. And we don't think about the process that just happened here. The process that just happened here is the exact same doctrine, the foundational doctrine that we rolled through in Romans chapter 8. There's a flesh and the spirit. There's pain. There's suffering. We have the privilege to call God Abba Father. So we get that. We have the Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ making intercession for us, and we can't be separated from the love of God. And that's exactly what Paul goes through when he looks at when he looks at things. He says, finally, he says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Backwards thinking to the flesh. Backwards thinking to the flesh is what we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. But folks, this, this is the meat of prayer life. It's, it's where the suffering of this world meets God's word, and we in our spirit 
are taking that suffering to God the Father and we are wrestling with his word to come out the other side in the spirit, thinking about things from God's perspective. Let me make this point. Most people think about prayer as a bargain. Not a bargain like it was a good deal, but as a bargain, I'm going to bargain with God. Look, I'll give up this, you give me this. Hey, we're both happy. We can negotiate here, right? Um, God, if, 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 if you just do this, then I will do this. It's, it's not just that request is included. It's that request is all that is included. And it's all about this, 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 that. Give me this, give me that. Do this, do this, do that. But scripturally, when you look at prayer and you look at the deep-seated prayer where somebody is falling on their face and suffering before God and saying, God, the pain of this earth is so much that I can't stand it anymore. Take this away from me. What we see is God's word has to enter into the inner man and that it has to overcome that flesh and look forward in hope to what Jesus Christ has done for us. It is not a bargain it is not a transaction, it is a process by which we overcome the flesh in this world by using his word. Now, I want you to go to Mark chapter 14, Mark chapter 14, because there's some things illustrated in Mark chapter 14, and you say, well, that's in the Gospels. And there's, 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 just some, there's just some good stuff here. So I told you to go to Mark <clears throat> chapter 14. And I want you to go to verse 34. And I want to make some points about this. Because you're, you're, you're actually going to see the Lord Jesus Christ, the same thing go on as he's dealing with his flesh, not wanting to go to the cross. His humanity. In verse 34 he says. And saith unto them. My soul is exceeding sorrowful, and sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Again that's not. <laughs> that's the watch. Pay attention. Be vigilant. And he went for, forward a little bit. And fell on the ground. And prayed that if it were possible. The hour might pass from him. And he said. Abba father. All things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. Now, I'm sometimes pretty limited in the powers of intellect. And I have a hard time in my mind thinking how Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, says... I don't want to go through with this, even knowing that he determined in eternity past that he will. And the only thing I can come up with is that it's his flesh, that, that he doesn't want to go through the pain, and he doesn't want to go through the suffering that this is going to bring, because nobody who is in a human body wants to go through pain or suffering. But he still asks the Father, Abba, Father, the same privilege that we get, to take away that from him. Because he knows, he says, if it's possible. So does he, understanding the will of God, does he say, I am not going to ask for this because it's not the will of God? He doesn't say that. What does he do? He says, take it away. Take this cup from me. He gives the request. He asks for the request because he's talking to his Abba, Father, you and I don't want to, if, if you have kids, you don't want your kids to only ask you and talk to you about things that they know you're going to be like, great, that's my boy, right? No, a real relationship, we take real problems and we communicate those problems and we seek out a conclusion to it through that dialogue and through that conversation. And what we see here. is we see Jesus Christ falling to the ground and praying that the hour might pass for him. 
But ultimately what he does is he says, not my will, but thine. So that's an important thing to understand about prayer. As I said, we want to look at the big picture, right? So ultimately, we want to take God's desires, learn about it through the word, learn what he wants, what he's doing today, make them our desires, and we want to take what the flesh wants and learn to put that to the side so that we can concentrate on the things of God and walk in the Spirit as Romans chapter 8 teaches us to. That is a process that we go to God the Father with, and it is the process by which we overcome the flesh by taking our knowledge of God's will and what he wants and wrestling with it in our prayer life, just like Jesus Christ did, just like the Apostle Paul did in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. There's other places where you see this principle. You see that the idea is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrestle with what God's will is. And ultimately... God's will for your life is that you come to the knowledge of the truth. Colossians chapter 1 talks about we get knowledge, wisdom, and spiritual understanding for the purpose that we might do what? Walk worthy. And then it goes on to say worthy unto all long-suffering. That's the Romans 8. We live in a sin-cursed world with joyfulness. That's the rejoice evermore. The only way you can do that is by looking at your hope and looking at what God has done for you. That's the end of Romans chapter 8. So when we pray, we're praying for that edification process to happen by working God's word into here. And we're praying our desires to God, letting him know whatever our desires are, but taking in what his desire is through the word so that we can walk in the spirit. And ultimately, so that the life of Christ can be made manifest in our mortal flesh. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, right? Where Paul talks about pain and suffering, but it's, hey, it's worth it that the life of Christ might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Go to, go to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. So this, this is Romans 8 in play. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4 says, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith. That's the Spirit. In all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. That's what's going on in the flesh. Are the, the, is the church at Thessalonica having a good time at it right now? No. They're experiencing persecution. And Paul says, we glory in you in the churches of God. Then he gives them, he gives them hope by telling them that God's going to make everything right. And then you get to verse 11 and you get to see his prayer for the saints. Wherefore, also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling to, fill, to fulfill all, his, all the goodness of his, to fill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. How can the life of Christ be made manifest in our mortal flesh without suffering if the life of Christ was suffering? It's a legitimate question, right? If the life of Christ is going to be manifest in my mortal flesh, and when I say Jesus Christ to you, you think about the death, burial, and resurrection, and that death was suffering. We get to sit here on this earth, Romans chapter 8, and we suffer, but we've been subjected in hope. And the idea is, is that the life of Christ might be manifest in our mortal, mortal flesh, or as 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 12 says, that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ 
may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, hopefully, what what, what will happen here is as you think about that pattern that we see in, in Romans chapter 8, that foundational thinking, as you go through and you read through Paul's epistles, you're going to see this pop up all over the place, and you'll see how prevalent it is in his writings. And I, I, I read and, I, and I, find, I find out things all the time. Notice what verse 14 says. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, and the depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. He talks about the whole family in heaven and earth being named there, and he talks that we need to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Why do we need to be strengthened? Because of the flesh because of the suffering in this world. And, 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 and notice this. In verse 20 it says, Now unto him that is able and exceeding abundantly to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Most people look at that and they say, you know, if I ask for $10, good chance I'm going to get 100 Might get 100 He can do above all I ask or think. And I might be, might be wrong. It could be even more. So I'm going to ask, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to watch, and I'm going to see how much he does. But did, did 2 Corinthians chapter 10 teaches us that we are casting down imaginations. That teaches us that spiritual warfare happens where? Inner man, spirit versus flesh. Romans chapter 8. And we see in Ephesians chapter 3, we see these same principles and he talks about that him being exceedingly, exceeding abundant above all that we ask or think. Well, why is that? Well, that's because, verse 17, Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. Do you think Paul accomplished more in his life through his suffering than he would have without his suffering? I think so. Do you think, do you think in heaven he says, you know, I wish I didn't have all that suffering. Or does he now realize what it did for him, that it was just a light affliction? That's what he's looking at. So this, this above, exceeding above, abundantly above what we think might be the power of Christ, as it says, working in us. And it might be that we take more than we ever think we could take in this world because Christ is working in us and being glorified in us just like the Thessalonian church. So let me leave you with this uh, last point. The, the, the first point was, think about big things. Think about God's, God's will. If, if, if I'm going to pray for the unsaved, I want to pray that I'm bold, and God opens doors of utter, utterance for me to do that. If I'm going to pray for you, I want to pray for the edification, and I want to pray for the process of that going on in your life, because that's what we see these prayers contain. As, as, as I wrestle with what goes on in the world, I'm not bargaining with God. I'm taking God's word and I'm plugging it in and having my inner man forget that flesh and, and, and go out and do what God wants to do. I'm going through the process instead of a bargain. And then the last thing I want to say is most people think about prayer as prayer is a magic thing where here is God's will and here is my will, and as I pray, the goal of my prayer life is to bend God's will to meet whatever thing I am going through. And that's exactly how people think about prayer life. That's why it's thought of as a bargain. It's thought that I'm going to take this, and I'm going to move it my way. 
I'm going to say, take this cup from me and move it my way. I'm going to say, take this thorn out of my flesh and move it my way. But what happens through the prayer process is it ends up with not my will but thine, and I end up bending my will towards what? God's will. It's a completely different process than what people want us to think it is. Now, I present you with all those things as something to think about with your prayer life. Start big. Think about the principles we learn in Romans chapter 8. Find verses in the scripture that show those principles in play. Realize that God's will in your life is you to be edified so that the life of Christ can be made manifest in your mortal flesh. And you're going to wrestle with that flesh and use the Abba Father that we have to take his word and to bend your will towards his by wrestling with the word in your prayer life. And just think that we can't be separated for the love that's in Christ and all the wonderful things that we have in him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and uh, we just thank you for all the things that we just don't deserve. We thank you for the privilege to call upon you. And I pray that as we do, we'll let our requests be made known. But that we will, through prayer and your word, bend our will towards yours. It's in your name we pray. Amen.